Okay, we are recording. Welcome everyone and welcome Leo. He's finally got in. That's good to see. We're all we're all here. Um thanks everyone. Uh, Josephine, would you like to introduce the session having uh, the, the event having put it together? Um you can do it if you want, that's fine. Okay. So welcome everyone. Um, this is uh, a teaching as part of a worldwide teaching supported by the Open Society Foundations and, uh, and Bard University in the US. As you can see from this map, this is, this is the, the latest, or not even the latest, a few days ago's map of the number of teachings that are happening today on climate justice. Uh, the purpose is really to hold conversations uh, across departmental staff, across disciplines within the university, and to reach out to those who are associates and, um, and the students to, to of these universities. The central core message really is to move, how can we move from despair and our climate anxiety and grief towards uh, an action agenda? And that'll be what we talk about across the three sessions today. This is the first of those. Um, at the end of this, we'll um, put the link up just to remind you, I've made it into a, <coughs> an easy link. Um, for the second session, which is on uh, financing the just transition. Um, the first session is on transformations and the final session is on uh, energy, just energy transitions. So we're gonna kick off uh, this session, which is the first one, which is on the idea of transformations and um, how to move from kind of debate to actions and solutions. I'll kick off with, with five minutes each from the speakers um, talking about research, and then we'll go through, you know, talking about food, Susanna talking about uh, gender, Leo about cities, and Fahani Yamin about activism and climate justice. So without further ado, uh, we haven't, most people haven't got slides, but I've got one that I want you to just to illustrate where I think we have a problem. And this is from the Reuters hot list of uh, climate scientists, the top 1,000 climate uh, related academics in the world. They produce this list. There are many questions about it in terms of how they produced it, in terms of who's most cited and why, um, which explains perhaps why it's skewed more towards the physical sciences than it is towards the social sciences, but that too reflects where the bulk of research funding uh, goes around the world. But what we see is that this, the people who are on this hot list are uh, incredibly skewed towards the global north um, relative to the actual distribution of, uh, of people, and I'd also say effort and, and where the problem lies around the world. This caused uh, some outcry, and not least amongst the editorial board of the journal Climate and Development, of which uh, I'm a member, and we put, for, put back a rebuttal, and it just says something about where we need to go for in regard to climate research uh, around the world, uh, and particularly one that is inclusive, that attempts to bring in perspectives from uh, other parts of the world, other ways of knowing, um, and how we can break a little bit about how we can break that down. So of these 1,000, only 122 were women. So that was particularly concerning. Um, and only 111 were actually scholars who were from, even if based elsewhere, from the global countries of the global south. And of those 111, 88 from China, we have a very strong uh, climate science community. So what we then did to compare, this is someone else's um, stats, but they compared them to the IPCC authors, which was also interesting to see that if you look at the IPCC author list, the, the distribution um, is actually much more balanced. There's still a massive dominance of Europe compared to the amount of uh, its population, but there is slightly more balanced than in this hot list. Whoops. Um, but, uh, but, you know, there's still a huge problematic. So where did we go um, as a, as a, as a board and our call was really to say there are actions that we can all take. So as scholars, as researchers, researching these interrelationships between the global north and south, we can actively cite those scholars, we can actively work with those scholars. We have discussions in our department that you shouldn't be publishing anything about work on the global south 
you know, as, as, a, as someone from the global north alone, there should always be co-publication and that should be one of our um, indicators. Working across disciplines um, and, you know, as editors of a journal, we can diversify the editorial board and our peer review uh, basis as well. Um, but we can also call on our publishers to do more, to make sure that journals are accessible to those all around the world, that we waive publishing fees where those exist, and they're subsidized by the rich institutions um, to enable that knowledge to come in from the global south. Make sure that we uh, anonymize all our peer review processes and double anonymize them so that there's no potential bias involved. Um, and you know, making sure that the, the, the journal subscriptions are available to those in the global south. So that was our kind of front piece to say, we can't change everything about research, but as a board, as, a, as, a, as an editorial group within a major academic journal, those are some things we can do. So I will pass over to the next speaker. Hi. <laughs> so uh, I actually have slides, but I'm, I'm, I don't think in five minutes I will be able to kind of go through them, but I'll just share uh, the screen. You're allowed to share one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, seeing that there. Yeah. Um, so basically what I proposed was the climate proofing our food uh, for the session. Um, but the, 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 the first prompt is like basically why, why do we, sh why should we think about food? And when um, thinking particularly around agriculture, we have seen lots of discussions about how climate change is negatively affecting food production and how this is a major problem for food security, particularly in the global south. Um, but typically when we talk about climate change mitigation, it is always about carbon, carbon, carbon emissions and less uh, about food. And then when we talk about climate resilience, it is about food and agriculture. Um, and I, I think that one kind of uh, shouldn't go without the other um, and that we need to also bring into discussion that food is basically one of the main drivers of, of climate uh, change as well. So this is why we need to think about it and like going from all of this into something that is more sustainable. Um, and from basically the research that I have conducted over the years, both in Papua New Guinea and in, in the Caribbean more recently, uh, the plantation kind of comes uh, into discussion, both in terms of its past legacies, but also in terms of today and, and continuous land grabbing and uh, total transformations of ecologies, uh, but also social relationships, political relationships, um, uh, creating these dependencies. So basically the plantation is this like very clear example of unjust transformation as uh, we can talk about it in those terms. So how can we come from this unjust transformation to a just transformation? Um, and from that, I was looking at like the problem of just transformation what is just transformation um does it it does it mean like to just transition to something in terms of uh, a new sort of development a uh, new sort of uh, agricultural economy uh, particularly around uh commercial farming, uh, in the more industrial farming, farming that will bring uh, money and development to these communities, which has been like most of the uh, World Bank projects have been about this, about creating these resilient uh, agricultural systems uh, that are both uh, at, at climate uh, resilient, but they are kind of a forced adaptation because of the ongoing um, transformations that are caused by climate change. Um, and we have these technical solutions that are brought in all of these projects around smart uh, agriculture, smart technology uh, to help uh, this transition. Uh, but is this just? Uh, what does it mean to, to have a, a just transition or just uh, transformation? Um, and here I, I kind of have want to prompt like the greenwashing of all of this in terms of um, projects. 
that in terms of plantations, we have like sustainable oil palm plantations currently and have a lot of discussions about how um, this is creating new opportunities for uh, local communities, but also is kind of uh, climate resilient and, and climate mitigating with offsetting uh, all the carbon emissions that are uh, created. We have currently new forms of solar being used, <laughs> like new solar renewable technologies being incorporated, which um, do not make much sense in the overall when we think about it in, in uh, world system uh, view. So taking from that, what can we do? So from all of these discussions that I've been having with farmers and communities and also youth in the Caribbean, particularly around food uh, and, 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 and the importance has been coming about um, how we should listen to stories of, of our ancestors, uh, the, eco uh, the ecology relationships that have been there for many years, uh, particularly around uh, human and plants and how we can live together and thrive together rather than completely shifting the uh, system uh, in, a, in a monoculture, uh, it, all for the purposes of development, right? So the, there, there are these conflicting views of local development, but also about local uh, resilience and, and, and resistance of particular forms of, of, uh, of livelihoods and lives. Um, and it, it, is a collabor it should be a collaborative process, uh, a collaborative process of sharing these stories and thinking about our food choices, but also thinking about um, what can be done in terms of incorporating more of, of these like polycultures where different plants are friends, they are families, they live together, they thrive together in a much better way if they grow, say a banana grows together with a areca palm uh, or a taro plant. And there are all of these stories uh, which might be considered as, as myths uh, by many of, of our, uh, the World Bank project uh, officers maybe, but they are very relevant and important uh, when we think about the projects. And I just put here this very little bit about, you know, net zero is not zero, uh, basically. And the whole idea is to, you know, we can have some renewables, but also st still have some fossil fuels in a few years. Um, but the question is, who can emit that? That has been uh, around COP and all of the uh, discussions. I, I, I would Dry, put this as a as a kind of uh, solution as well. Uh, if we ha can do the same for plantations, for example, because we know the majority of them are in the global south, like how can we measure? Like how can we make this a ratio? Could it work? And uh, in terms of like land grabs and land justice, yeah, that's me. I hope it's five minutes. Perfect. Thank you very much. It's five minutes thirty seconds. So yeah, spot on. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can I call in Leo Horn Panatai from WRI next? He's worried that his battery might die, so he's going to bump you. I'm going to bump you down, Susanna. But that's okay. Thank you. Hi everyone. Great to be with you today. And um, I apologize. I'm joining on my phone, so I actually prepared some nice slides, but um, maybe I can make those available to our participants uh, separately. Um, so this is a fabulously rich and complex um, uh, layered topic that we're talking about today. And uh, one that I'm really just starting to, to scratch the surface off. And so I, I'm joining today very much in the spirit and with a mindset of listening and learning. Uh, so for me, very much more of a, a learning than, than a teach in. And very pleased to be joined by some really um, uh, great speakers today. I'll be speaking about the role of cities and um, in, in the just transition and driving um, or advancing climate justice. And I'll be uh, speaking to you uh, from a practitioner's perspective, giving you that view rather than an academic one. And I thought I'd start by just uh, sharing with you some, some pointers on climate uh, justice and, and, and how it relates to cities. And the way I think about injustice is that it is really in the simplest form, it's unfair inequality. And just to put into perspective where we are in the world and how we are trending, the current global inequalities are close to the levels that we've last seen in the early, early 20th century, which is you know, at the peak of Western imperialism. The share of people presently, uh, uh, the, sh the share of income presently captured by the poorest half of the world's people is about half of what it was in, 19, in, sorry, in 1820. And climate change, as well as the, the COVID-19 pandemic have increased global inequality. 
such that for the first time in the last two decades, we've seen actually global extreme poverty levels rise in, in 2020. And the inequality that we're seeing is unfair because it is, it is a result of a political choice. Over the last four decades, we've seen countries, sorry, we've seen nations become richer, uh, but governments become poorer. And the, the pandemic has hit us so hard because it laid bare decades of chronic underinvestment in public goods and services that poor, poor people uh, disproportionately rely upon. So climate, climate justice is, is, is a multidimensional issue and it speaks to unequal impacts, responsibility, power and resources. And any serious uh, action on climate confronts at least three key injustices. And several of you will be familiar with these. First, the, uh, the injustice that those who contributed the least to the problem, uh, the poor and the vulnerable, are the ones who are the front line of impacts. They will suffer the, the, the most immediately and the most severely from climate change. And this is a structural thing. It's, it's a feature of our system. Um, in addition to the asymmetry of impacts, the second point relates to our response. Because we have left it so late, uh, to act and there's so little time to make the drastic reductions in emissions that are needed. Poor countries and peoples are called upon to aggressively reduce their emissions despite having contributed relatively little to causing the problem in the first place. And so the path to prosperity that rich countries took is now no longer available to developing countries. This is what Lord Stern referred to as the brutal arithmetic of climate change. And the third one is temporal is the fact that the lack of progress addressing climate change today constitutes an injustice to future generations, which will have to contend with the climate impacts and uh, th that will have been locked in by, by um, our inaction or earlier generations inaction. And they will, as a result, face a curtailment of their development options and choices as a result of that. So how do cities play into, uh, how do they figure in, in the action that is needed to, to address climate injustice? And what roles do they play in the, in the just transition to a low carbon climate resilient future? Well, first, cities are a huge and, and really unavoidable part of the problem. They, despite occupying only 2% of uh, the global land mass, they contribute uh, two thirds to, to three quarters of the world's um, global energy related uh, emissions. And with 2.5 billion more people expected to uh, 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 move into cities in, uh, by mid-century, this problem will only grow. And 60% of the projected urban area, uh, the, the projected area that will be urban by 2050 uh, to accommodate this inflow of, of, of 2.5 billion people has yet to be built, which means that uh, we will more than double the amount of urban built infrastructure in the next few decades. And a lot of this growth is happening in, in is ex a lot of this expansion is, is into climate vulnerable uh, disaster prone, prone areas. So cities are a big part of the problem, uh, but more importantly, they are an equally unavoidable and huge part of the solution. And I think it's no exaggeration to say that cities are at the heart of the transformation that is needed. And the IPCC special report of 2018 on global warming of 1.5 degrees uh, noted that urban systems provide the most powerful lever for ramping up climate actions. In fact, with their concentrations of people, economic activity and infrastructure, Cities are one of the few systems that can be decarbonized and made resilient fast enough to meet the, uh, the Paris Agreement goals. But there's a crucial caveat. The transformation that is needed is not just a transition to net zero. It is, it's a transition that has to be just. And uh, so I'll, I'll put aside the moral reasons for that because I assume we all can uh, agree with that. There's also a very strong instrumental one for why that is so. And, and that is because of the legitimacy uh, without addressing injustices, there's no way to, uh, that, that we, we're undermining the legitimacy and the ability to muster the political will and broad-based support that is needed to drive these, uh, for these ambitious uh, program of change. So the broad-based societal, society's buy-in is absolutely crucial if we're gonna undertake and successfully carry through these, uh, this long-term change project. And the key point today that I want to make is that cities are not just key to unlocking uh, climate action, but they're key to unlocking the kind of climate action that is needed to get to net zero and climate resilient economies 
and societies in the real world, which means that we need to think about issues of political legitimacy, legitimacy and um, uh, a support. So how can these uh, help? I'm gonna wrap up now. Um, three, three, three cr crucial points. Uh, firstly, um, cities, uh, as I said, concentration of people, infrastructure, uh, resources, uh, crucial to building the capacities uh, to adapt and, and respond. Access to uh, improving access to urban services, amenities, resources is going to be uh, an, a crucial part of the of how we empower people uh, to face uh, more climate uncertain future. Secondly, cities are crucial spaces for civic engagement and inclusion. And one of the things that really gave me heart in this uh, pandemic was seeing the one thousand spots of light uh, in cities, the innovation happening. Uh, we have, I think, Farhana Yamin on, on, online with us, um, driving change, uh, 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 civic engagement in, in, in Camden. We see similar uh, civic engagement happening across the world, democratic innovation. This is really uh, an exciting story coming out of the pandemic and which gives me a lot of hope. And relatedly, the third point is cities as laboratories of change and innovation. And so one final thing I'll just say is that for cities to be able to, to, to become the engines of low carbon, climate resilient development and a just transition will require a revolution in the way that cities are planned, in the way they're built and run. And this is a revolution that cannot happen through the actions of city leaders alone. It really requires the energies, the ingenuity of all of us as citizens, as consumers and as change agents. So I'll leave you with that. Um, how am I doing on time? Nine minutes, mate. Well done. <laughs> no, it's really great. Thank you very much. Um, food for thought, absolutely. Um, sorry to bump you along then, Susanna. Would you like to give us your five minute? Yes, I'm just going to show my one slide. Sesh on uh, gender and transformation, just transitions. Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. So, We've heard about transformation in research, we've heard about food, we've heard about cities. And now we're gonna move on to think about what does a gender just transformation look like? And I think the theme of gender relationships and gender equality actually kind of threads through the talks we've heard so far. So Tom in some ways was explicit about um, women and men and the breakdowns in authors. But if we think even about cities and food systems, if we take a gender equality or gender transformative lens, it, it it makes us ask ourselves, but how does that work for different groups within those cities, for different groups of women, women who are marginalized, women who are more privileged? How do relationships and identities intersect to make people either more vulnerable to climate change or to put them in a position to address climate change? So I will very address very quickly why, why talk about gender equality in the context of the transformation. And it's really for a number of perspectives. One is that um, women and different groups of women are often the worst affected by uh, climate extreme events and slow onset climate events, but also that women can be real agents of change, both around building resilience and also around the mitigation and the just transition and the just transformation agenda. And as uh, I wanted to use these kind of two quotes on my slide just to frame a little bit what I'm talking about. And so Nyla Kabir's work here from the LSE Kind of emphasizes why, why talk about gender equality in this context. And so she says that gender inequality is structured into the organization of social relationships in society. So it's really fundamental to how institutions function, how we relate to each other, how our politics and economics um, is framed and implemented. So at a very basic level, what does a gender just um, transformation or transition look like? It would look like involving women meaningfully in, in decisions and, and processes that affected them, it would look at thinking about their practical needs on a day-to-day -day basis. How do their needs, how are their needs different from other groups of men or between different groups of women? And what are their strategic needs? How, how can they be supported or, or work together to have greater voice in those conversations and influencing things that affect their lives? And a big emphasis on, on this type of work has also been thinking about how do we make sure that women's caring responsibilities and their reproductive responsibilities are reflected in the way that we think about transition and transformation. So there are things that women are supported to do, which are part of society and need to be thought of integrally as part of a transition or a transformation. But really that's just the kind of stepping stone and the starting point. And gender analysts or gender specialists will often think about things on a spectrum from being gender blind 
to being gender sensitive or more gender responsive, and finally to being gender transformative. But I've been doing some work um, with IID, with Simon Anderson and the um, gender expert group of the Green Growth Knowledge Platform. And we've been asking ourselves, actually, what does it mean to be gender transformative in the context of the just transition? Because I think what we are suggesting is actually, it's not very clear exactly what that transformation might look like. And actually, what it might look like really depends on the type of lens that you take on it. So there's been some really interesting work putting together feminist theory, looking at different Green New Deals to say if we took a feminist uh, theoretical perspective to this, and of course, there are many, many different feminist perspectives. So they open up many different questions. What would a gender just or gender transformative transition look like? So these types of um, lenses and theories open up uh, different opportunities for gender equality, such as um, what is the role of um, exploitation within a patriarchal system? Uh, what are the intersectional identities? How do they intersect with uh, other power relationships such as post-colonialism? How does it intersect with broader agendas such as the decolonization debates around the climate agenda? And there are really, there's really interesting work from other scholars um, looking at how, uh, if we take a particular feminist perspective, we might um, think about um, gender equality is also being about allowing groups to build solidarity and through a kind of praxis of solidarity, um, which is, uh, um, just forgotten the reference, I don't, <laughs> don't want to take someone's work in vain, it's a really interesting work. Um, so think about how that kind of as a praxis of solidarity could also be thought about as a feminist way of achieving um, a just transition. Um, and then if we think about that on a more practical level, and where I've just got 30 seconds left, from a just transition, that means we move beyond thinking about um, green jobs just in the oil and gas sector, for example. We don't just think about, okay, coal miners. We take a bigger perspective to say, well, if that's important, what role, firstly, what role are women playing within these transitions? Are they in clerical roles? Are they supporting husbands to do work or partners? But then we could also look at it from a more regional perspective. How is the economy of this area, previously coal producing area, supporting women? What are women's roles more broadly? And if we think about the just transformation with a much bigger lens, then we could think about women's role and the relationships between um, different gendered groups in a much broader way, which would ultimately be more transformative. So lastly, we were asked to think, okay, how do we bring this debate into action? And hopefully we'll have a kind of better conversation about that. But what I just wanted to say is what we can see in the work of organizations trying to implement this on the ground, that there's really high aspiration. We can see kind of feminist green new deals. We can see transformative language in documents and policies and programs. But what there's very little evidence yet is how does that actually get turned into practice? And the many challenges and barriers to implementation. So I think the real question there is how do we move from now what's a kind of policy rhetoric and aspiration to making that um, real in practice and reality. Okay, thanks, that's five minutes for me. Fabulous, thank you. Thanks for the provocations. I've just been looking actually at um, this morning at uh, programs of mentoring and linking groups of women working in the renewable sector and how actually building that solidarity between women across different countries, trying to improve the, the professional jobs. There's plenty of you know admin jobs being done by women in the renewable sector but given that you've got an expansion from 11 million to 42 million jobs globally in, in the next five five to ten years there's there's plenty of female engineers and you know entrepreneurs and innovators and trying to improve those by linking up uh, globally and, and using that practice of solidarity you talked about so that's fascinating thank you right i'm very happy that um that we might uh I've got Fahana Yamin here with us, um, an international environmental lawyer and uh, very famously campaigner through Extinction Rebellion and more recently with uh, working with Camden, but also um, obviously central linchpin of Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Climate Agreement, um, someone who's been in the room for those things. So com combine that kind of uh, policy practice with the activism on the ground. So take it away, Fahana. <coughs> Hey, thank you. And um, uh, I came in very much at the last minute, so I don't have slides, but I'll put a link to some of the work that I'm doing um, on climate justice and just transition, working mainly now with philanthropies and trying to get uh, philanthropies to engage, but also fundamentally to change their mindsets and to shift essentially power and resources to the global south and to take into account what an intersectional approach to 
to climate change would look like, and it would look like uh, uh, an approach which you know takes inequalities, which you know all of the brilliant speakers before me have highlighted. People who are based in the global south, people who have contributed the least, people who have are impacted the most, are women who are structurally disadvantaged still would take 150 years to reach inequality according to the UN figures uh, and have gone backwards in, in terms of COVID. Uh, those with disabilities and those with uh, gender differences, those are some of the main ways in which inequality is structured uh, and which climate change would uh, exacerbate, including actions to tackle it, which is not based on just transition principles. So a lot of words uh, to to pick up and highlight and say, actually all different struggles, climate change is just the sort of symptom of the underlying ways in which our social and economic and political system is really messed up and does not put equality, does not put nature, does not put people at the heart uh, at, at, and their well-being at the heart of its uh, its operation uh, of, of its DNA, you know, and its DNA was formed 400 years ago when uh, half the people in this room would not count as legal persons worthy of uh, respect and entitled to the protection of the law. So my work is very much um, evolved over a period of time and including, you know, knowing Thomas from a very long time ago now, I think, uh, back when we were both at the Institute of Development Studies, uh, with you know people uh, who were pushing then the, the the more systemic ways in which we needed to tackle this problem, uh, like Nabila uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, all of the participation team whose work you know I'm, I draw on, and Thomas who started the Climate and Development Journal. So thank you very much for taking that all forward and in this brilliant program that you're that you're doing. You're very modest and humble about what you're what, what you've achieved, but you really achieved a lot. Um, I, I'm going to put a link into the chat, and I guess um, where I am in my journey is much more um, on the activist and the practitioner end. I always have been. I've retained a foothold in academia, but I've learned best from lived experience, from practices, and from working in collaboration with others around me. I've always found academia uh, uh, is a great base, but you know I have uh, many other uh, ways in which uh, information and knowledge and power. Uh, can be shared and distributed and drawn upon uh, in that. So <clears throat> that's um, led me in the end to actually um, downgrade or re you know reject the traditional world of diplomacy and academia and uh, um, <clears throat> multilateral negotiations, which I had been working on for more or less 30 years, you know, attended pretty much every single one of those COPs. Uh, I missed two over the last 25, 30 years. Um, and have attended most of the UN summits, and they have achieved a huge amount. We have got these massive international, international legally binding structures. We have got legally binding commitments for, you know, massive aid flows as, as large as what is going on in the ODA world, just supposed to address additionally climate impacts of 100 billion. Uh, we are uh, developing, you know, huge types of mechanisms, including carbon markets, which are currently, much to my sadness, mostly greenwashing and recycling and not uh, delivering, you know, the true uh, transformation that uh, they were promised. Um, and we are engaging more and more actors in this amazing pattern of and web of governance. Mm -hmm. So the climate negotiations, these COPs, um, are now the largest UN uh, meetings, actually, they, uh, except for the UN General Assembly, but actually in civil society participation terms, they're much larger even than I think the, the, the General Assembly. So we routinely have now 30,000 upwards participants uh, and Glasgow exceeded that as well. And that was in the middle of COVID. So these are massive gatherings where global conversations about everything is happening by everyone as much as possible. And I'm super, super excited by that, about, about that. And I think that the, the first point uh, we've learned from our disability rights movement activists is nothing about us without us. And that is the key part, is a cornerstone of my own thinking and um, uh, you know, there's no there's no justice if you don't have the right people in the room and all sorts of decisions are being made. So that is what I'm sort of focusing on and making sure that now philanthropy supports 
what I call Jedi initiatives, justice, equality, diversity, and inclusion, and that it's not enough just to have representation. It's not enough just to have a bunch of women, sorry. I've, I've been there, done that myself, been part of that. It's important that those women then understand and fight for and, and see things from an intersectional lens and fight for equality. And then finally, just a little plug. Um, uh, I guess I've moved from, from being an academic that writes in a very academic way to to being a storyteller, telling my own story as well in, in ways that will, I hope, catalyze, inspire, encourage, question, ask people to challenge me, but uh, doing that in much shorter blurbs, articles, podcasts, videos, and so forth. And part of that is my, I guess, uh, understanding that we we actually now need more storytellers than scientists is my shortest way of saying it. It's not we don't need the scientists, it's just we've had you know, six rounds now by the end of this year of IPCC reports, thousands of upon thousands of additional papers. Academia has led the way on making the right knowledge available at the right time. And by and large, it's been ignored or it has not led to the changes that it should, which is why we're at the tipping point of a massive uh, and devastating set of impacts, you know, that are going to be visited upon the global south, are, are being visited upon the global south. So that's why I did join Extinction Rebellion. I thought it was high time that we said enough is enough and that those of us who had been on the inside and who had, um, I guess, a sort of special place in the climate establishment, you know, said we are not doing things uh, in the way that we need to. We are not taking risks. We have to support those who are taking risks, especially those in the global south who are, you know, being being um, arrested, beaten, murdered, imprisoned, and denied actually access to the very basics and whose resources are being um, uh, part of the extractivist economy and very, very harsh uh, conditions for protests all around the world. So we who in this country still have uh, civil rights, which are shrinking, uh, you know, by the day, um, we have to stand up and speak and uh, take more courageous actions. And that's the sort of journey that I'm still on. Um, and I feel that as a lawyer, it was very important for me to stand with those who are choosing to break the law as part of a st strategy to uh, um, raise the alarm and to tell the truth and to to point out to the flaws of our political system. I'm sure I'm running over time because I forgot to press my button uh, um, uh, telling me when five minutes was up, um, but I'm gonna put in the chat uh, some uh, information that those of you who are interested uh, can come to and please contact me. And I would love to um, uh, leave a little, uh, um, uh, uh, a little, uh, you know, plea to, to please be in touch because one of the things I'm doing now is for philanthropy to compile frankly a massive database of resources and campaigns and people working on climate justice and just transition so we have a sort of first draft of that and we would love to have it reviewed and for everyone to pile in it's going to be an open source mapping most mappings that done by philanthropy never see the light of day they're confidential private mappings done by and for uh, uh, philanthropy itself and the idea of this one is to uh, make it open source and accessible over time. And it's, I sort of see it very much as an attempt to start a dictionary, a who's who uh, of, of those working in the climate justice space and all these brilliant initiatives. Um, so I would love to invite you and all those who are involved in your teachings and throughout to, to be in touch and collaborate on that and give us ideas for improving it. It's just, as I said, an initial uh, quite nerdy document and I'm quite nerdy about that. And then secondly, if you would like to, please do watch um, a film called Rebellion, which is about to come out um, on the 1st of April, so in two days time, which tells the story of the movement Extinction Rebellion and uh, I feature in it. So it's not just because of that. It's, I think that everyone must become more activists, you know, add the word activist to their CVs. We need to all do something different. We need to all challenge the status quo. We can all do that differently. So it's really a calling card, um, you know, to explain to people why, why people do, you know, what they do uh, in, uh, in, in this case, Extinction Rebellion and to, to humanize the stories of those who are collaborating and especially working on climate justice. So I'll put the links in Thomas, but thank you so much for your time. I'm sure I'm really over time. So apologies for that. And uh, thank you for having me and thank you for having this brilliant set of uh, webinars and seminars too. No props. Thank you ever so much. Um, fantastic. I will also put in the, uh, the caveat in the chat that I did not start the, the, 
the Climate and Development Journal. I think props for Lisa Chipper and Bridget Klein and others for that. But I'm uh, I'm, I'm an associate editor now. But I, I'll also put the link to, to that article that I spoke of in the in the uh, chat now too. So thanks to you to all uh, for those um, contributions. And um, we do have a little bit of time if you want to. If there's any comments from those um, who are participating who want to pitch in, please do just raise your raise your hand and um, and we can unmute. Uh, if anyone's feeling bold and brave, I saw a hand, Lorna. Hi, um, really interesting um, talks. Thank you to you all. I'd really like to pick up on um, the points that I think, Bahana, you made about there's nothing with nothing about us without us. And Susanna said about you know how do you make that policy and all the achievements we've had interaction. So how, what are your thoughts about how do you really get participation? I've worked as a um, social enterprise and community business advisor. I know, I know how difficult it can be to engage particularly the people that you really need to engage with. So how does this happen? If it's got to be all of us, how do we get that wider awareness, interest, and galvanised interaction. Uh, uh, open to any speaker who would like to comment. You say he wants to pile in. Unmute yourself and. Uh... Um, well, I, I guess I, I'll pile in a little bit. Look, I think the first thing we have to do is train everyone that actually they can't make these decisions. If if the right people are not in the room, they can't make them. And that is like a really yeah. extraordinary statement. And it doesn't go down well with people when you say you cannot move forward mm -hmm. because then they feel like, no, but my work is really urgent. My intentions are great. You know, I'm so mm -hmm. sorry they haven't been able to come to this meeting. I'm, I'm so sorry that the timing is wrong, that they don't have the money to attend or they don't have the, you know, I'm going to just carry on regardless. I've done my best. I'm going to carry on regardless. And that I think I found over 30 years is the most fundamental you know, point at which to, to say, no, actually, you can't, you can't go on your work, whatever, however urgent you think it is, it's going to be flawed. And the assumptions that you've made mm. about your role here is wrong. Um, and, and so I, I, that, that is one of the ways in which I'm doing that. The second thing is, I, I think we're opening up. And again, Extinction Rebellion had a really major impact. And I think that this will go forward. They did put forward new forms, you know, a sort 